gonna quit over here. Perfect. All right. Welcome everyone. Thank you again for attending Google Workspace and Microsoft Interoperability. Um, this is one of the last sessions that we have in our Google for Education Internet to uh, Net Plus uh, webinar series. So definitely welcome again, and we're excited to have you all here. Um, also wanted to do a quick plug for our government and education summit that we'll actually be holding uh, November 3rd and 4th. Uh, learn how public sector leaders are driving digital transformation at our government and education summit on November 3rd and 4th and, and learn from a couple of your colleagues who are going to be speaking as well. Okay, so for today's agenda, a um, couple things that we're going to do as well. I know you all probably know us and have been attending a couple of these sessions, so know us pretty well at this point. Um, but we're going to get started with some quick introductions again. Then uh, Dana, who's on the call as well from Internet2, will dive into a number of the um, a number of the, the items regarding the Internet2 project uh, with Google Workspace for Education. We then will go through the overview of interoperability that Google Workspace has with Microsoft. And then we'll have a short portion for Q&A as well. Um, so yeah, so excited to kind of dive into the details today and, and get started. So just quick intros again, Leighton Spencer, I am a Google Workspace for Education Specialist here at Google. Uh, I primarily support higher education as a whole. Um, also joined here by my technical counterpart, Ken Matthews, uh, who is my solutions engineer. And he'll actually be running through a lot of today's content um, from his perspective. And then Dana, feel free to introduce yourself. Um, hi, I'm Dana Voss, Program Manager at Internet2, responsible for the relationship with Google for the Net Plus Google for um, Workspace for Education program. So um, as with any Net Plus program, we um, went through a, a thorough evaluation of Google Workspace for Education, which was started last year in May. We had a number of universities participate in the evaluation of Net Plus Google Workspace for Education. At the time, of course, it was Giuseppe. Um, the group of universities split into various war groups, and we went through a feature and functionality evaluation, a security evaluation, which included the review of the HECVAT, identity evaluation, and accessibility, which included the review of uh, all the VPAD documents that Google makes available, and also some testing. Um, all the materials from that evaluation are available to anyone who's interested in getting access to those materials. Um, and then once we completed the technical evaluation, we issued a request for information to help us select the resellers for the Net Plus program for Google Workspace for Education. Again, with the help of the universities um, involved in the evaluation, we selected um, Amplified IT and Burwood. Um, Amplified IT and Burwood are the only two resellers authorized for the Net Plus program at this time. Um, and then in the first part of this year, we uh, worked with um, the help of about almost 30 universities on the terms and conditions and especially the pricing. Um, so the agreement became available to the higher education community at the end of June. Um, and just a heads up that we do have a promotion in place for those universities who sign before December 1, 2021 uh, for a four year agreement for the plus edition. Um, there's no fee until January 2023, uh, delayed enforcement of the storage policy. And for those who have at least $50,000 in annual spend with GCP, there is an additional 500 terabytes in storage. Um, the full details on what's included are in the FAQ, and we have a link to the FAQ at uh, the end of the presentation. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to take just a moment to thank the universities who helped with the service evaluation. Uh, we couldn't have done this without you, and uh, we currently have 
over 10 universities who have subscribed to the offering and many more who are in conversations with either Burwood or Amplified IT at this point to become subscribers. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Um, so uh, yeah, today I wanted to go over, it's going to be a little bit of a change from our previous um, discussions and presentations uh, where I've jumped into a demo. Um, this is a particular complex talk topic, so uh, I'm just going to do a high-level overview of all the various features that we have, how we essentially look at coexistence uh, from our side of the house uh, with Microsoft tools. Uh, and then uh, that should leave us a, a little bit more time at the end for any questions uh, that you may have as it relates to what you see here today. Um, so to dive into it, you know, how we're essentially looking at this, we're looking at it through three different scenarios. Uh, you have a split coexistence scenario in, in which you have users who are using uh, Google Workspace, uh, or, uh, the tools from Google Workspace, uh, and then you have users in a separate department maybe that are using Microsoft tools. I think in the higher education environment, the use case around this would essentially be um, students are using the, the Google tools and your faculty and staff as well as your uh, administration uh, would be using the Microsoft tools. Uh, we also uh, uh, look at dual existence scenarios where maybe some members of your faculty and staff uh, may be interested in using Drive or uh, any of the other tools that, that, that comes with Google, uh, but they may prefer to use uh, Outlook and Exchange in terms of how their email is routed. And then, of course, there's the external collaboration. So how do I, as an institution, collaborate? If I'm a Google school, how do I collaborate with uh, uh, other institutions or other clients or other users out in, the, out in the world who are using Microsoft tools. And we'll go over all of that in a later slide. Uh, these are essentially the three areas that we look at when, we, when we're talking about coexistence, where it's needed. Uh, email and calendaring, of course. Uh, so how my emails uh, are routed between uh, organizations that are using these two tools. Uh, and how do I schedule calendar events uh, with uh, users who are using these two tools. Uh, as well, uh, we're looking at collaboration. So how can I collaborate between the Google editors as, uh, and effectively collaborate with people who are using the Microsoft editors? And then there's this uh, edge case uh, where we're talking about communication. So your institution uh, may have uh, existing uh, virtual conference hardware. How do I integrate Meet if I want to use Meet? How do I integrate that with the existing conference hardware? Uh, and there are options available for that. Um, moving on to uh, email messaging with colleagues, how do we look at that? Uh, we look at it as a split coexistence or as what we like to call split email delivery. Uh, some of you may on this call already be doing this or aware of this, uh, but in this particular slide, we're looking at uh, all the inbound email uh, being represented by the blue arrows, uh, your intra-domain or intra-institution email, uh, how your users are communicating with each other uh, would be uh, represented in yellow. Uh, and the outbound would be represented in green. Uh, in this particular scenario, the MX is tied to Google, so all information coming from externally would first go to Gmail for those users. If that user doesn't exist within the workspace instance, you can use a catch-all routing rule to be able to route that information to your existing infrastructure, whether it be on-prem exchange or Office 365. You might have an existing AV, spam, or DLP, uh, either service or appliance that you're utilizing to be able to scan that information. Uh, and then on the Microsoft side, you would be leveraging an alias domain. So you would set that up in Workspace, and you would tell Microsoft how to route that information so that your users within your institution could essentially, essentially communicate uh, under the same address domain space. Um, this is how we would set it up. You also have the ability uh, to route, uh, as you can see from the, from the, uh, the graph here, most of it's going to route externally through uh, either side. Um, uh, but you do have the ability to leverage that existing AB, spam, and DLP by routing your Gmail traffic directly through that if you wanted to as an outbound gateway. Uh, moving to scheduling meetings with colleagues, uh, you do have the, with calendar interop, you do have the ability to, um, for your uh, Outlook users as well as your Google Calendar users to be able to see free, busy, or full details uh, without uh, any loss of functionality um, between the two environments. Uh, so uh, if I'm a Google user, I can uh, see uh, all of the details of a, a Microsoft user uh, pr prior to being able to set up that appointment. Um, I also have the ability on the Google environment side to be able to propose to organizers who are using Microsoft new times. So if I see that I'm unable to attend a particular meeting, 
I can hit this propose new time and that will send in, uh, the, uh, the proposal to that Microsoft user and they can make changes uh, essentially um, not creating any roadblocks in terms of my communication. Uh, as you would see it in Google, you can actually use that uh, with Microsoft tools as well. Uh, and you can open up Exchange resource booking. So if you have a number of Exchange resources, either on your on-prem Exchange or your Office 365 environment, you are able to open up that so that that's surfaced within uh, calendar events within the Google side. Uh, you can see which rooms are available. You can uh, filter by status if you need to. You can search for specific rooms. All of that would be open to you uh, as you are creating events in Google. And of course, you can forward invitations between the two, the two environments. Uh, this would be a similar thing that you would be doing on the Exchange side as well, but you could essentially uh, simply forward the invitation to anybody who wasn't on the original invitation uh, to add additional attendees and make an RSVP from that invite. The configuration of calendar interrupt at a very high level, it is a, a significantly more complex than this. We have documentation to be able to walk you through all the various steps, including some of the commands that you can run in PowerShell on the Exchange side to be able to set this up. Uh, but step one, you'd be creating role accounts both in Workspace and Exchange. Uh, you'd be uh, step two, enabling that on the Google side. And then on step three, you'd be enabling it on the calendar Exchange side, um, or sorry, the Exchange side. And of course, we do have tools, calendar interrupt tools that will give you that you can use and leverage to be able to test that availability and test that functionality between the two sites prior to pushing it out to your users if you need. Uh, collaborating with uh, Office files, we have a number of, uh, of items that make this a little bit easier, especially if you're working within a Google environment, but you're working with users who uh, uh, favor the Word, Excel, or PowerPoint options. Uh, you're able to natively um, using doc sheets and slides, edit directly from the browser window if you need. Uh, that functionality exists. How that looks in practice, essentially uh, your user will open up a, a document that is from Office. Uh, they'll see a preview. They'll choose to open that up within Sheets in this particular instance. They'll see the extension of the file up at the top uh, that lets them know that this is an Excel file that they're working on, and they'll be able to work as if they would work with the Sheets, a native Google Sheets file. They can make comments, they can make edits. Using real-time presence, all of this information will be surfaced to any other collaborators within the document. Uh, so this is essentially a similar experience that you would get if you were working just natively with Google itself as well. Uh, as I said, there's no need to import or con convert any of these items directly into uh, our native Google Doc format. You can work with them as is. Uh, the sharing, real-time collaboration, commenting, version history, all of that is open. Uh, the same way it would be open for Google Documents. Uh, intelligent features like Smart Compose also available uh, as you're working on these Office files. Uh, so there's really no loss of functionality in, the, in that sense. Uh, commenting as well is open in preview. Uh, so if you didn't want to actually go through that second step of opening it up in a native doc or sheet or slide, you can comment directly within the preview, uh, assign uh, users on your team to be able to, uh, uh, you know, to that particular document, highlight that, area, open up the comment, and, and work as you would within Google Doc Sheets and Slides. We do support hundreds of files types for this commenting functionality. Uh, so not only for Word, PowerPoint, Excel, and PDF, but you also have uh, access to a number of uh, uh, image files, uh, audio files, uh, video files, all of that, Adobe files, all of that will be open to you. Um, so this kind of speaks to the ethos here at Google that, you know, we don't want to work at cross odds with any of the other applications that are out there, any other technologies that are out there, but uh, we essentially want to work collaboratively with everything that exists because that's just what happens in the real world. And Google Drive for desktop would be another tool uh, where this would come into to play uh, is if you have a number of users uh, that are used to a particular way of working um, as it applies to like uh, uh, network shares, for instance, if they have a particular H drive or a G drive that they have on their machine and they're used to going into that to be able to access their files, Google Drive for Desktop gives that option uh, to be able to create that quote unquote network share that will point to their Google Drive files. Uh, if you uh, as an organization are thinking about migrating away from a network file share uh, and migrating toward a sync solution, uh, our sync solution offers that ability to kind of seamlessly give that end user the experience that they would have uh, if they were working within uh, uh, an environment that had network-attached storage. Um, 
you're also able to access any of those Google Drive files directly from the traditional desktop. This is supported both on Mac and PC. Uh, if we're talking about you know, redirection scenarios where you're redirecting docs and desktop files from Windows using GPO, uh, you have the ability to do that with the uh, Google Drive for desktop utility as well. And of course, the latest version of any of the files that are located in Drive will always be in Google Drive. You have the ability to go back on versioning in the web uh, application, uh, but you're always going to be presented with the latest version as you're working on it. You also have the ability to edit with confidence uh, with the uh, concept of real-time presence. Uh, so essentially, you may have users that uh, prefer to use the Office apps. Uh, what they will do is they will open that particular uh, uh, document in this case, we're working with a Word doc. They will open that, and it will open directly within uh, Word within their Mac. I believe that we're working on a Mac in this case, or their PC. Uh, and they'll see in the lower right-hand corner this safe to edit real-time presence status, uh, 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 status bar. Uh, it'll essentially tell uh, that particular user that they can go ahead and they can edit that document. It's safe to edit. Any of the other, there may be a number of viewers on that particular document, but in this particular case, no one is actually editing that doc, so it's safe to edit in that case. Um, how does this individual item work, this real-time presence server work? Uh, it essentially, uh, the drive for desktop utility, uh, it works with the Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and native Office APIs. It communicates uh, or pulls those APIs to be able to find out what is actually happening to that document, so in this case, the user is typing on that particular document, user being Gina. Uh, the Drive for Desktop takes that status, communicates that to our Google Drive real-time presence server, uh, and then that will then essentially uh, be surfaced as Gina is editing this document, which will then push that down to Oliver, and Oliver's computer using Drive for Desktop to tell him that he should wait to edit that document. Uh, so when Oliver is working on that document, he'll see that status, say wait to edit, when it's uh, safe to edit, it'll, it'll update as safe to edit, and this will avoid any conflicts when working directly with Drive for Desktop and uh, specific Office files and applications. We do also have pin code sharing, uh, or visitor sharing, we like to call it. So um, you are able to actually share uh, Google Doc native sheets and slides or other files directly with other users who may not have a Google account. Uh, there is a seven-day window on this. Um, so after seven days, you'll have to reshare that item. Uh, but uh, users who don't want to have a Google account, they can still have access to all the various collaborative features and uh, access those files within that seven-day window. Uh, moving on to communication, uh, where we look at this, we work with a third-party uh, interop gateway provider called Prexit. Uh, if you are um, uh, using uh, Google Meet in your environment, and you have a number of, of items here. You have your web, you have your mobile. Uh, if you had Chrome boxes for meetings, you could take that service uh, and using this third-party interop gateway, uh, you could set that up either on-prem through the various uh, virtualization softwares that are available, or you could set it up in the cloud, either with Google, Amazon, or Azure, or you can set up a hybrid environment. Uh, and that would essentially, using these protocols, SIP, H3, 23, as well as Skype for Business, if you're using that, it would present that uh, to uh, those particular hardware uh, uh, devices that you have on site, and it would open up Meet uh, to be able to work directly on those, those uh, devices. We also have the ability to leverage a, a particular tool that just came out for Workspace Plus uh, as an option, uh, AppSheet. Uh, and this is, uh, this is important in terms of uh, concepts around being pro-platform agnostic. Uh, so when we're looking at this, uh, traditional uh, development life cycles, uh, you see that it's a five-step process, essentially. You have the idea, you spec out the project, you talk to your development team, they go ahead and code it and test it and work out any bugs that may exist with that, and then they present a solution. Uh, with AppSheet, you actually are opening this up so that you shorten that life cycle to go from idea uh, to solution. Uh, and essentially what that means for your organization is your development team could potentially um, work 10 times faster in terms of uh, developing applications for your users. Uh, you have the ability to uh, work with SQL databases, uh, Excel uh, spreadsheets, as well as Sheets. Um, and you can leverage that information as well and open it up to, say, some citizen developers who may not have the necessary skills to get deep in the weeds with coding a particular application, uh, but they have a bunch of ideas and they want to work towards a solution and they can open this up using this particular tool. Um, 
Essentially, what you're doing is you're connecting to any of these resources. Those resources don't have to be Google. Uh, obviously, we prefer if they were, but if they are not, you can open it up to Google and Microsoft as well. Uh, you can customize that application, and you can deploy that application to a number of devices, whether it's your desktop, your Macs, your PCs, your Windows, uh, any, other, uh, any Windows devices, your tablets, your Android devices, uh, your mobile devices, all of that would be open to you. And to round out the conversation today and the presentation today, I wouldn't, uh, it would be remiss if I didn't mention all the other resources that we have available that are going to dive a little bit deeper into uh, this particular topic. Uh, when one of those resources would be a case study done by Atos. Uh, this is a white paper. It does exist within the admin console, or sorry, the uh, admin help center articles. Uh, you uh, can read through that, and it doesn't give you uh, some deep technical information, but it does give you, based on their experience working with other clients in multiple environments, it gives you specific use cases and uh, things to look out for when you're working with Calendar Interrupt, for instance, or when you're uh, routing email between two different environments, or if you have specific users who want to use Meet uh, and other users who want to use Teams and how those meeting uh, invitations uh, essentially uh, open up to users across platform. And we also have a number of technical transition guides, uh, one of them on Calendar Interrupt that will do a deep dive in terms of how to set that up. Uh, we do have uh, also another one that I'll call out. Uh, if you go to the admin center and you actually just type in technical transition guides, there's another one that talks about ransomware. Uh, I know that's a, a particularly hot topic uh, uh, within security circles. Uh, so that's something to look at in terms of how uh, Google Drive for Desktop works uh, in, um, in, in helping you to defend against ransomware, how to leverage some of the Google tools uh, to be able to defend against that and teaming up with, uh, if you were interested in teaming up with Chrome OS, uh, to be able to get that full security um, a narrative around uh, protecting yourself against ransomware. And we're at the Q&A section, so I'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, I see that there were a number of items that probably came through on chat. Uh, forgive me if I did not see that, but I can pull through it. But if any of you have any questions, uh, the floor is open. Uh, I am yours. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to answer them for you. Perfect. No, thank you, Ken. Um, so we do have the first question coming in from Robin. Um, and it says, right now you cannot uh, add a visitor at a shared drive level. Do you expect in the future you will be able to? And yes. Was, okay. I, I, I mean, I, you know, I'm particularly um, looking at, uh, I believe that there's a feature request out there on this. Um, uh, so that's something that the engineering team is knowing. I don't have an ETA on when that would be available or it's something that they are aware of. Perfect. No, thank you, Ken. Yeah. Um, and Robin, if any other questions kind of arise there, please don't hesitate to, to jump in. Um, and then the next one uh, was from Joseph. I did um, kind of respond with that this recording will actually be posted to the YouTube playlist channel um, that will highlight everything that Ken has covered. But Ken, I did want to just make sure that um, you had an opportunity to touch on this. So. What are your recommendations or recommended ways to integrate both Google Calendar and Office 365 Calendar in a hybrid environment? Pretty sure that we went, went through this at the beginning, but just wanted to make sure if there's any additional insights you wanted to add here, you have that opportunity, Ken. Yeah, so as you probably heard, Joseph, at the end, uh, all those resources that I mentioned are going to give you uh, the technical transition guides. There's one particular item around Calendar Interop. It'll give you the details on how to set that up. Uh, and as well, I think it's important to go through the case study because you're going to see how that actually plays out for end users based on real world scenarios that they pulled. Um, so, uh, you know, at a high level, essentially, you're going to create role accounts in both environments mm -hmm. so that you can read the information from either environment in terms of the calendar availability. It can be full, it can be uh, free busy. Uh, and then you're going to uh, enable that both in both environments. And then you'll have the ability on your exchange side to be able to run with our tools to be able to test that to make sure that it's working appropriately. Um, is there support for that? In, um, we tried it uh, about a year ago, and we had to backtrack. It, I don't remember the details, but it was a disaster from the end user perspective. Um, there should, yes, it's a tool that we offer. Um, okay. so there should be, I mean, I, they may, the Google side of the house may be a little reticent to uh, make recommendations on what you do on the exchange side. Uh, we do have some, right. some, right. uh, our docs actually go through some actually specific uh, PowerShell commands that you can run on the exchange side, uh, but it is a supported tool. So they should, support should work with you on that. To be able okay, to we'll try it again. 
Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. And again, Joseph, if you do have any uh, any pushback or any anything that does occur, yeah, please don't hesitate to reach out to your Google representative. Um, we're more than happy to assist um, with those support issues as well. Um, okay. And then I see uh, Nicholas, you've raised your hand, um, but I so go ahead, and then I'll read Stones off next. So go ahead. Uh, Nicholas. I wanted to follow up to Joseph's question there as well. So does that require a fully developed exchange environment for that interop to work correctly? Um, so the scenario is we've been a primarily Google environment and we're looking to add Microsoft 365. Um, but if we can leverage the Google's primary calendar functionality, because we've built our infrastructure around that without fully developing exchange, that would be almost a preferable situation. But it didn't seem like that interopt um was quite leveraging that functionality or, or is that possible is the question um uh, from my understanding the actual role accounts would be a mail enabled account on some level uh, i believe there are um tools out there to be able to limit that functionality but because of that uh, logically i would think they would have to be uh, exchanged with the environment to make that work thank you perfect thank you um, and then uh, we have a question here from Stone. Uh, currently, if a, vis a visitor leaves a drive file uh, they're shared on, their email address disappears from the document's shared history. Uh, is there a workaround to this? Or maybe, uh, or like, sorry, maybe this has already been a changed. Uh, I have actually not heard of this, but I'm, I'm happy to dig into this for you. Um, do you have, uh, I'll open it up to you since, uh, you know, do you have a particular case number that I can look in and dig into this for you? If not, I, you know, I can do some digging on this myself. Uh, but I've not heard this, uh, heard this come up. Yeah. I, might need to, I might need to create an official case for that. Um, but just when we were looking at using this with the, um, because we have both a Microsoft and a Google sort of situation and our HIPAA configuration requires us to be able to have that history. And when we first tried to use visitor sharing between the two, we sort of ran into that block where we couldn't really leverage that ability just with our own HIPAA users for that very reason. But it, it might be if, if it's an official sort of, like if I can make an official case and then um, bring it up, then maybe I can uh, try to have our team follow up with that. Uh, yeah, definitely. If there's an official case, uh, I'll also uh, log this as well and uh, put it on my tracker, internal tracker, because there may be a, a deal blocker that relates to this um, uh, that I can at least search, uh, search for and you know see if this is something that they're working on. Yeah, if it's not, I mean, even just a way to somehow log that history, which BigQuery might be able to do something like that if, if it would log that and then not lose it afterwards. But yeah, we'll all look at that and see if a follow up about it. Yeah, yeah. Stone, feel free to send that over to me too once you submit that ticket number, um, since I kind of cover you from a workspace perspective. So yeah, feel free to share that with me and I'm happy to look into that as well. For sure. Thanks a ton. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so we have about a minute left, everyone. So um, if there are any burning questions, uh, now is the time. Um, if not, uh, I think Ken, or we have one more from Joseph. So uh, do you have any insights into the development timeline or roadmap uh, for the new V8 editor in AppScript? Currently interested in knowing when the Rhino engine features versioning, for example, will be released. I don't believe I have that off the top of my head. Ken, I'm not sure if you do. I'm aware of it. I can't remember the timeline on that, but I'm aware of the bug that's out there for that. So um, that, that's going to be something that I'll have to follow up right here, Joseph. Um, Okay, perfect. All right, thank you, Joseph. Um, and then thank you, everyone. I think uh, there's one more slide, Ken, if you just advance it. Okay, I'm sorry. No, you're good. Over. Um, yep, so again, we have a frequently asked questions uh, that are you know directly related to um, the internet too and net plus contracting. Uh, there's also a Slack channel um, that you all can access with net plus and internet too directly. Um, the webinar series, this is the last scheduled event. So we do have one more session coming up. It's to be scheduled or to be determined. Uh, but once that is, we will send out the same uh, kind of notifications the way that we did in the past. Um, if you have any direct questions for Internet 2 or Net Plus, 
there was contact information of Dana, and then also um, a net plus at internet2.edu alias. Um, but yeah, but appreciate the time again, everyone. Thank you again. Um, be on the lookout for when we do schedule the Google Workspace for Education Storage Tools webinar. And then, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you all then. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good one. Take care. Bye.